You know how Canadian shows get a bad rap? Well, if the title wasn't a dead giveaway, we're taking a look at some of my favorite shows to come from my home and native land. If you're just joining us, I recommend you go back and watch the first part. But for everyone else, let's get this ball rolling, eh? Whether you're Canadian or American, 16 is one show I'm betting you're pretty familiar with. It became an instant favorite when I first watched it, but I was surprised at how not kid-friendly it was. Its G rating came with some mild cursing, a lot of sexual innuendo, and more censored nudity than I could have ever expected. I didn't want my mom catching me watching this because I didn't know if she'd have a problem with it. But after a while, I realized this is a show about a bunch of teenagers, so of course things are gonna be a little more mature while still being quite immature. The main group of six really feel like the best of friends. They take shots at each other, embarrass each other, and do just the stupidest things sometimes. But when it really counts, they don't think twice and they've got each other's backs, like a close-knit family. When it came to the humor, this show delivered, and years later, I'm still in tears from half of the jokes. You have no idea how much I still quote this show. Yellow is mellow. They thought I was gay. I'm so not gay. I have I am not working for a big box store. I think I can actually feel my soul dying inside me. So the show could be very funny, but when it dived into subjects real teenagers might deal with, it was also handled well. Stuff like breakups, finding a job, losing a job, or friends' parents getting married and suddenly becoming step-siblings. But the one I always go to is the episode Enter the Dragon, where the girls are all going through their time of the month. At 11 years old, it gave me a clear understanding of the topic, and when I got older, and saw this one again, I was impressed how it was all done so casually, like it was a normal everyday thing. I've heard the episode didn't air in the States, along with at least 20 others, but again, topics like these were handled with care, and a lot of laughs I might add. It made me aware of what tampons were, and I'll just say, when sorting through groceries, my brother and I would always do this when we stumbled on a package of them. Get out, tampons! Retreat! Now, let's talk about a show that, if you're not from Canada, you've likely never heard of. Yvonne of the Yukon, the other quintessential Canadian show. It was about a Frenchman who went to explore the new world in the 1600s, only to go off course, get frozen for 300 years, and thaw out in the present day in the town of Up Your Muckluck in the Yukon, which does not exist, I looked this up. Fun fact, this series was created by Ian James Corlett and Terry Classen, and if you're familiar with your ocean dubbed anime, yes, it's true. Goku and Krillin made a show about a Frenchman in his underwear. I didn't watch Yvonne much when I was younger because I thought it looked gross, but I got around to seeing some episodes a couple years ago, and while it is most certainly crude, it's still good. At that point, it had been a while since I saw a Canadian cartoon that took its time in establishing a scene or its characters, and it was very refreshing. I was like, oh my gosh, this show has an honest three-act structure with people just talking, moments of silence, music cues. This show is quality. This was the show that sparked this whole video idea. I thought to myself, more people need to know about this stuff. I also gotta give special mention to the show's theme song. Even when I didn't watch Yvonne, I knew this song by heart growing up. I'd say it's one of the most iconic openings to a Canadian cartoon. It tells you the whole setup of the show and is super catchy and fun to sing. It's like an old folk song mixed with a sea shanty. He soon found himself in a bit of a pickle. The frigid North Seas proved more than fickle. Yvonne's navigation would soon cost a price. He was knocked overboard and turned most of the main cast of characters aren't exactly pretty, but I got used to the art style in no time at all. The big exception is Luba. She's one of two characters with a decent face, and combined with her voice, I kind of fell in love with her. Every time she's on screen, I am locked in. This show's got a lot of jokes that'll make you wonder how it ever got away with a G rating. And this isn't on the line of something like Animaniacs where you'd go, ooh, that was a little dirty. This show's sense of humor is warped and twisted, and I love it. I'm surprised they got away with what they did even back then, but I think it's because it was Canadian, our TV standards were a bit more lax, and we were the only ones who were really seeing this. In a lot of ways, that's pretty cool. There's one episode where they brought in a Canadian Mountie named Major Sweetly as the new law in town, but he took everything to the extreme. We later find out he's an escaped gun nut, and he gets his comeuppance by the end of the episode, but the icing on the cake was a little disclaimer in the credits. No Mounties were harmed in the filming of this episode. Major Sweetly 
was an imposter. Had he been a legitimate officer, he would have been treated with respect. Since he wasn't, we blowed him up real good. This show is unfortunately hard to find in its entirety. There's 52 episodes, but only the first season was ever put out on DVD, and it's not cheap either. I've been getting by with what gets uploaded to YouTube. The more I watch, the more I'm happy to have been around during this show's run. Yvonne of the Yukon makes me proud to be a Canadian, and that's no joke. After Yvonne wrapped up, Ian James Corlett went on to make a series based on his early life in the form of Being Ian, a show about 12-year-old Ian Kelly who dreams of becoming a filmmaker. This has always been one of my favorites, and though I wasn't one for filmmaking, I did love movies and TV and had a vivid imagination. I'd find myself daydreaming about making my own stuff, and I'm still crazy about that now, so I saw a lot of myself in Ian. Like Yvonne, Being Ian has a great cast of characters that make for lots of different situations and stories. And since Ian's obsessed with movies, the show also makes tons of great movie and TV references, usually in Ian's daydreams. Things like Terminator, Indiana Jones, Oh Brother Where Art Thou? That reference made me go, wow, they really do know their movies. It also makes a lot of references to Canada, which always got my attention since it didn't happen very often in cartoons, but I was more than happy to see them. Especially when the joke wasn't just, oh, Canadians are peaceful to a fall, don't you know? One of my favorite episodes is Hockey Night in Burnaby. I'm not into hockey at all, but this episode makes me a fan of the sport for just a brief moment. There's a clear passion for the game, and I like how even though Ian and his family have radically different interests, one thing they do share is a love for the sport. Because of this episode, I know who Canucks player Trevor Linden is, and it was also my proper introduction to the song The Good Old Hockey Game, which I am a fan of. Even during this episode's credits, they play a hockey-themed version of the theme song. That is awesome. Being Ian was a lot less crude than Yvonne, but it did have its share of adult humor. I remember there was at least three times where they used the word hell, and I was like, what? Ian and Yvonne also crossed over in a YTV event called The Big Barbecue Blowout, showing back-to-back -back episodes of their shows on Canada Day. The second time they did this, they got several other YTV shows in on the party and bumpers throughout the day, from Jacob Tutu to Captain Flamingo to Jane and the Dragon. And at the end of the day, Martin Mystery called up Ian to tell him he was on his way, but the party was already over. I didn't watch Martin Mystery, but I knew that was so in character, like of course Martin would be late. That was one of the coolest things YTV ever did for sure. Sure, but going back to being Ian, that show is a rare Canadian success story. 65 episodes, two hour long specials, Ian even hosted an event called Popcorn Till You Drop Corn where they showed blockbuster movies on Oscar Sunday. Brilliant! I'm glad it got to do what it wanted to do and it's still a great show. I definitely recommend it. In the immortal words of one of my college professors, does anybody remember this show? I said to myself, I am the only person on this planet who's gonna talk about urban vermin in any sort of capacity, so darn it, I need to talk about this. It centers around a war between two raccoon brothers for the city's garbage, with Abe's Garbage Liberation Front trying to overthrow Ken's rat army and free the block from his reign. First thing you probably notice about the show is the animation, and it's kind of a mixed bag, even back when it first aired. Running and action scenes can be a bit janky looking, but the lip sync isn't half bad. I'm positive the show's crew didn't go into it thinking, ha, let's make this look bad for the heck of it. Given the technology and how expensive it probably was at the time, they did the best they could with what they had, and it gets the job done. I can still say this show has an identity. There's character backstories, continuity, and a good sense of humor. Even with a premise like Brothers at War, the show never took itself too seriously. The stuff they get up to is like kids playing a recurring game of pretend war in the park, and I mean that in the best way I can. Ken and Abe would get under each other's skin in ways only siblings could, and that's where some of the best dialogue came in. Unfortunately, you are nothing but a petty tyrant surrounded by mindless henchmen. For example, No Neck. I order you to flick my ear. Ouch! What did you do that for? You ordered me. I didn't. It was the letter. P.S. I bet you just crumpled up this letter. Ow! Me and my own brother would always be like, dude, you're just like Abe slash Ken in this situation right here. One episode had Ken and Abe argue over a pie, and when Abe finally gives it up, Ken's like, you know I hate pie. And Abe goes, how can you hate pie? At the time this aired, I was not a big fan of pie, and seeing that I went, oh no, I'm Ken. And since then, I've loved pie. True story. And every now and then, they'd call a truce for a birthday or some other kind of get-together, and they cut each other some slack just as a reminder that, hey, we're brothers, 
and we still care for each other deep down. Like when Ablek can capture his team after regaining his title as the Rat Army's leader, after losing it to a traitor called Kim John Shrill. As I mentioned earlier, one of my college teachers had a hand in this show, and one time in class he was talking about how it didn't get much of an audience and said, anybody ever heard of Urban Vermin? And I proudly raised my hand, and from that day we were good buddies. My oldest brother was a fan of this show too, I just remember him going on about how Madman was the funniest thing, but I was more a fan of No Neck. He's this big terrifying colonel, but he's pretty kind hearted and has a bunch of hobbies on the side. Karaoke. Yeah, can we do a duet? Maybe, uh... Islands on the stream? Now nah, you're talking. You give Urban Vermin a chance and it just might grow on you. Now if I may, I'd like to talk about Canada's take on the anime scene. In the 90s and 2000s, a lot of it found its way to Canada for dubbing, and for us, that equal to Canadian-made content that we could air due to government mandates, blah blah blah. So as far as I'm concerned, they're Canadian. Sailor Moon was among my first anime alongside Pokemon, and while I didn't follow the story, I still thought it was cool. It was a big influence to my drawing style too. This show has so many great great expressions that I never get tired of seeing. I want to get into this series real bad, but I don't know whether to watch the original dub, the original Japanese, or the Viz redub, but I digress. Sailor Moon and Canada go together like PB&J. One anime that I did watch a lot of was Hamtaro, a show that was easy to understand just from the slogan, Little Hamsters Big Adventures, and it struck a chord with me. I don't even like hamsters in real life, but I'll make an exception for these little guys. Hamtaro himself was a natural born leader, and I looked up to him when I was younger. Whether a hamster was bigger, tougher, or smarter than him, Hamtaro was the one who kept everybody calm and got the group out of a jam. And the dude was a chick magnet without even knowing it. I don't know how a hamster made me go, I wanna be that guy, but he did it. Who am I kidding, I still wanna be like Hamtaro. The show was also super cute, and the theme song hasn't left my head since I first heard it. The second theme is my favorite, but even in the second grade, me and my friends kinda made fun of the first one, though that one did show up on YTV's Big Fun Party Mix album. Also, did anybody think think that Hamtaro and Oxnard's owners looked a little skinny, like sickly skinny? It cannot just be me. And if you're talking about Canadian dubbed anime, you gotta talk Dragon Ball. I still think it's so weird there's two English dubs for Dragon Ball for two countries right next to each other. In the early to mid 2000s, YTV had all three series running at the same time. Monday to Thursday it was Dragon Ball at 8, Dragon Ball Z at 8.30, and GT on Friday nights. I guess the order of the shows by what letters came after Dragon Ball, plus I thought GT looked old than Z, but in truth, the shows were dubbed in the reverse order of what I thought. Z, GT, and finally the original. I was well aware of DBZ, but didn't even try to keep up with it because it was never at the start of the story. I didn't watch GT either, but I loved the show's intro and credits themes. Our dub kept the original music with our own lyrics, and though the ending was just an instrumental, it's a darn good one. That song signified a Friday night, and that the anime block Bionix was about to begin, but more on that later. My show of choice was the original Dragon Ball. It was lighthearted fun and easy to follow. It also had a PG rating, so I felt cool watching something that just had a little extra edge to the usual stuff I saw. Most of the more adult content was left alone in this dub too. I remember missing the episode where Nam fought Ranfan in the tournament, and looking back, I'd say it was a good thing I did. From what I've seen, this dub used the same script the Funimation dub used. When re-watching that version, I caught a few lines that were shared between the two, like verbatim. But what finishing move can I use? His body's too small for a lock, just a stubby torso and short little legs. But what finishing move can I use? His body's too small for a lock, just a stubby torso and short little legs. One place where we changed things up though were with naming schemes. Things like the Power Pole and the Evil Containment Wave were known by their Japanese names, the Nioibo and Mafuba for instance. When using the Power Pole, Goku always said, Nioibo extend! And if someone brings up the Power Pole, I think, oh, the Nioibo. What's also different about this dub is that what we saw in Canada was actually the broadcast used for the UK, which made all the background music sound higher pitched because of how broadcasting worked in PAL regions compared to NTSC. The master tapes used for this dub were also in awful quality, but I didn't mind it. Felt like I was watching a really old vintage anime. A number of voices in this dub I like just as much as, if not more, than the American version. I like the takes on Oolong, Krillin, Roshi, Pilaf, and Goku a lot. To me, this is probably my favorite voice for Kid Goku, and he's got quite a bit of sass under that sweet face. Here's the way it's gonna be. You follow my orders and I won't turn you into vulture food. Understand? Now cough up the ball, kid. <laughs> cough up the ball? What am I, a cat? 
All you're gonna get from me is a sore head, pal. I found the Dragon Ball, so you can't have it. So long, weirdo. I recorded a few episodes of Dragon Ball back in the day, but eventually taped over them with another SpongeBob or something, since I thought it was always gonna be around. Had I known this dub was hard to find on Canadian TV, no less, I would have saved what I had. All I have left is the episode where Goku fought Jackie Chun in the tournament finals, and it's still one of my favorites of the series. A bit of trivia about this one in particular, too. During the climax of the fight, an insert song is used in the Japanese version, but the Funimation dub has the scene silent as they couldn't get the rights to the track. In this dub, we opted out for a rockin' instrumental, and according to my sources, this was taken from the score used in the Ocean dub of Dragon Ball Z. I know it's not the best version of the series out there, but it's still an interesting take on Dragon Ball, and I'd love to rewatch it again. If there were an official DVD release of this dub, I would scoop it up in a heartbeat. Also wouldn't mind if we got a release of this underrated gem. Aw yeah, Metabots! The show that never became the next Pokemon or Digimon, but is still fondly remembered by the fans it did make. After years of putting it off, I rewatched the series earlier this year, and what a ride that was. I almost wanted to do a video on Metabots itself by the end of it all. Most anime up here gets recorded in Vancouver or Calgary, but Metabots was done in Toronto, my old stomping grounds. The acting can be a bit hit or miss, but this was 2001, we were all still figuring this whole dubbing thing out. And you can still tell the guys in charge of the script and the actors themselves were having so much fun. Let's talk a little bit about Metabi, huh? Metabi has a completely different take in the English version, but it's such a fun take, I don't mind it. In fact, I prefer it. I remember hearing him talk the first time and thinking, that's what he sounds like? Dude, he talks just like my older brother. This is so awesome. Oh, uh, Metabi, why are you reading the funny pages? Because your dad got the sports. Okay, wise guy, let's get this straight. You're my Metabot, I'm your Metabot. I don't know what's making the biggest stink here. You or your feet. He's voiced by Joseph Motiki, who fans of TVO Kids in the 90s will remember as one of the hosts of The Crawl Space. Others may know him as Madman on Urban Vermin, the host of the YTV show Game Gurus. He's done a lot of stuff and still at it today, and just like Metabi, a real cool guy. What's great with Metabi is that since he doesn't have a mouth, there's a lot of room for his improvised lines and jokes. Half of what he says makes me go pretty sure he's not saying this in the original, but I don't even care. I will not rest until I see those kids swinging from monkey bars. I swear it. This gets extended to the rest of the cast too. There's a lot of honest wit and self-awareness going on with pop culture references and the occasional adult joke that caught me off guard. <laughs> Metabots did what I like best about adaptations, taking full advantage of what they're given and adapting it for their audience, but staying true to the original story. It also didn't stray from its Japanese roots. Many characters keep their original names, cultural references are everywhere, and they flat out say they live in Japan all the time. As a kid, I felt like I was getting a glimpse into what Japanese kids might be like, eating octopus balls and fighting with robots on the school ground and whatnot. My favorite character to this day is Mr. Referee. He's like Beware from the Pokemon Sun and Moon anime, in how he shows up out of nowhere in a creative way relating to the situation. One episode has him show up to referee a row battle, but they didn't need him, and he's just crushed. And it happens again later in the episode! He was voiced by Dennis Kamiya, who unfortunately passed away in 2018. If you ever watched the movie Pixels, or even just the trailer, he played Pac-Man's creator Toru Iwatani in that thing. He really brought that referee to life. Other greats include the Phantom Renegade, voiced by the announcer guy for the the comedy network, and Samantha, who I didn't know was a girl the very first time I watched, but still found her cool. I like how she's a rough and tough tomboy, but is more than fine with things like ballerina classes, and her voice was hilariously charming. I didn't put this group together so I could sew all day! I wouldn't call it a day, it's been half an hour. Let's not get technical, okay? I have no idea how our actress was able to pull that off for so long. <coughs> and like 50% of the males in this show are voiced by Terry McGurin, so if you watched 16, get ready to hear a lot of variations of Jonesy. The one character I remember hating was Rintaro. Good God, I wanted to punch that kid in the face, and I still do. Metabots' art style is also great, with characters being very expressive and designs that lend themselves to great exaggeration. 
and when the animation gets really good, they go all out. The Ninja Mountain episode is one of the best out there, as it was directed by the guy who would become the director behind Gurren Lagann, complete with explosions, over-the-top expressions, and fan service shots that were kept in the dub to my surprise. If you haven't seen this series in a while or you haven't seen it at all, go watch it, like right now. It's a ton of fun being one of those shows that's even better than I remember. Just stick with the first 52 episodes. Season three is not so good, and I remember why I didn't watch that. I guess I better talk a little bit about our late night anime block, Bionics. Basically, the Canadian version of Toonami, but without a host. I didn't watch much of the block in its prime, mainly because I was a bit too young and the slightest splash of blood made my skin crawl, but one thing I loved was listening to the openings of several of the block shows. I had never heard Japanese themes on TV before then, and it was magical hearing the themes to Eureka 7, Naruto, Gundam Sea Destiny, and especially Inuyasha. Inuyasha was a big deal up here, and being dubbed by Ocean Studios probably helped. It debuted on YTV in 2003, and the next year, it was the number one most popular search query on Google in Canada. I knew of a few people who watched it religiously, but all I could pick up was Inuyasha is a half-demon man and wants to kill Naraku, but he can't, and when Kagome says, sit boy, he falls to the ground like a brick. Also couldn't take him seriously after finding out him and Ian from being Ian shared the same voice. Inuyasha was on right after Dragon Ball before Bionics, and I remember the first episode I properly saw was one with some girl who could cut people up. That was like episode four. But back to the music, the first opening and ending I heard was Grip and Itazura na Kiss, respectively, and the other songs came soon after. There was a point where YTV had ads played during Inuyasha's end credits, and fans apparently got so upset with them they eventually aired the endings uninterrupted. A good, good call, I say. Really wish I saw more of Bionics, though I did catch the last ever broadcast in January 2010, when it was on at midnight till 2 a.m., and all they had were reruns of Naruto and Bleach. I'd totally watch it if they ever brought it back, though. Just saying. Up until the last couple years, I used to rag on about how most Canadian TV wasn't anything special, but I really should have known better. There's no doubt in my mind Canada's got some great stuff under its belt. Not only that, but a lot of the shows and the channels that housed them were influential in shaping me into the person that I am today, and I wouldn't change that for anything. The best stuff we've done, I dare say, could only be done in Canada, and I feel so lucky to have grown up or more closely relate to some of the most unique content I can think of. And yeah, our output as of late hasn't been too great, but the reasoning doesn't just stop at because Canada, and I hope things will bounce back someday. Weirder things have happened, am I right? I also hope that someday I'm able to make a series of my own that's as unique as what I've seen over the years. And whether it's made here or not, people are gonna know it came from a Canadian. Hey there guys, thanks for taking the time to watch this video, I really, really appreciate it. If there's a Canadian show that you guys enjoy or one that I didn't talk about, please sound off in the comments below. I'd love to hear what you watched and keep an eye out for anything else I should see. And if you enjoyed this video, feel free to give it a like, share with a friend, subscribe, all that good stuff. I'll be going into some behind the scenes stuff on how this whole retrospective was made and if that's something you'd like to see for yourselves, be sure to check out my Patreon page because that's where I'll be going into to excessive detail. And once again, if you haven't seen Nitro Rad's video on Canadian television, be sure to give that a watch too. And with all that said, I will see you guys next time. Keep your stick on the ice.